Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy uh, Women's History Month. It's great to be here with all of you. My name is Joshua Furman. I am the curator of the Houston Jewish History Archive at Rice University and a lecturer in the program in Jewish Studies. And I'm so thrilled to uh, bring you today's program, a conversation with Dr. Pamela Nadell about her award-winning book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. Um, and uh, today's program is co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Rice University as well. Today's event is going to be recorded and it will be made available on the uh, Rice University School of Humanities YouTube channel shortly after the event. So you can look forward to watching it there um, as well. I want to encourage all of our attendees to submit questions for Dr. Nadell using the Zoom webinar uh, Q&A function, which is a button uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and you can submit those at any time. And we are hoping to have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of today's program to uh, discuss your questions. Um, joining me as co-moderator today is uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Melissa Weininger, who is the um, Anna Smith Fine Senior Lecturer in Jewish Studies here at Rice. And I'm gonna turn things over to Melissa and um, she's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Josh. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Nadell, I just wanted to let everybody know about some upcoming events um, that are being sponsored by the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Rice, which is a frequent uh, collaborator with the program in Jewish Studies. Um, coming up this week on Thursday, March 4th, is an event called uh, The Gender of Migration and the Migration of Gender, uh, a discussion about um, gender and immigration. So a topic that's uh, not unrelated to our discussion today. Um, and then also coming up next week, uh, we have uh, Martha Jones speaking about what if Black women have always been the vanguard of voting rights? So those are two of our upcoming events for um, uh, Women's History Month. Uh, and I will put the links for the signups to those events into the chat so that um, you can access them easily if you like. Uh, but today we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Pamela Nadell, as uh, Josh mentioned, who's the author of America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today which was published in 2019 and won the National Jewish Book Award for Jewish Book of the Year. She's the Patrick Clendenin Chair in Women's and Gender History at American University in Washington, DC, and a recipient of the university's highest faculty award, Scholar Teacher of the Year. She's also a past president of the Association for Jewish Studies and has received the American Jewish Historical Society's Lee Max Friedman Award for distinguished service to the profession. Uh, and she's going to open up with a brief presentation about the book before we start our conversation. So I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you, Joshua, for inviting me. Um, thank you to the program in Jewish studies and to the Center for Women's um, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Rice University. It's such a pleasure to be, be with you. And I, I, I hope everybody on this call, on this webinar today is, um, has recovered from the very difficult circumstances of the past couple of weeks. Um, I, I'm going to start by sharing my screen just for a few minutes, just to give you a sense of a couple of slides. And I hope that you can see that. Everybody see that? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Sounds good. Um, so I, I opened the book with something that for a faculty member is a little bit unusual. I actually start with some family photos. In this one, which is hanging on the wall of my dining room, you can see my great grandmother, 
And if you look very closely at her hairline, it's very obvious that she's wearing a wig. She's wearing what would have been called a scheidel, the wig that an observant married Jewish woman would have worn in the first decade of the 20th century when this was taken. Um, and many observant married Jewish women will continue to wear one down until this day. What's interesting about the photo also is that she's wearing a dress that one of my former students who's getting a PhD in apparel design told me went out of style in 1870. But I know that that was taken in the first decade of the 20th century. And the reason I know that is because this photo is of her daughter, my grandmother. She's about 14 or so at the time this is taken. And she's very she she. She has a bow in her hair. You might be able to see bows on, on her shoes. One of the great advantages of Zoom, you can see the images up close. And what I love about this is the dress that she's wearing was called a linen dress or a lingerie dress. And it was only in style between 1903 and 1910, which also helps me to date the image. In this photo, the woman with her back to us in a park on a warm spring day is my mother. She has on a straight black pencil skirt and a white blouse. And if you look really carefully over her shoulder here, you can see my arrow, you can see a baby's bonnet peeking out. That's me. So I didn't bring a picture of me because you don't need to see me because I'm here. And actually, what am I wearing? I am wearing the black jacket of a female faculty member because that's what I have worn for my entire academic career. But you might be wondering um, why I'm talking so much about clothing. And in this image, you see my daughter and she is wearing what a college student would wear. And when, so it's, she's got on a short skirt, she's got on tall boots. And when, um, when I said to her, I need a photo to make this point in my, in my talk, can I have one? She said, mom, you can have it, but you have to tell everyone that the boots are yours, which of course I completely had forgotten. So the point is, what am I doing talking about these images of um, America's Jewish women in, in, in my family in a book that, that's meant to talk about the breadth of the experience of Jewish women? from the moment they, the first ones landed in 1654, all the way up into the 21st century. But the story that I'm telling here, and I'm gonna stop sharing, um, the story is I was led into it in some way by those photos. So if I think about how the clothing of the women in my family changed across the generations, I began to raise other questions questions about how had their lives changed? What was different, not just about their clothing, but what was different about the, the way they raised their families, what they cooked in their kitchens, what those kitchens were like? What about the kinds of work that they did? What about the kinds of work that they were not permitted to do? What, what was different? I wanted to know what was different about their politics. I wanted to know what was different about the games they played. I wanted to know when did Mahjong become a Jewish woman's game? And I can tell you it was the 1920s. So I had so many questions and the clothing in a sense drew me into that story. And I started to think about how do I categorize Jewish women? They're very diverse. Um, they, they, when we look at the community internally, we see, you know, just so many different um, expressions of what it means to be a Jew and a woman. And I started to think that I needed to approach them as if they were in kind of three buckets. Um, there's one bucket of Jewish women who move from Sabbath to Sabbath, from holiday to holiday. Judaism is foundational to their life. It determines where they shop, who they talk to, what's in their kitchens. There's another large bucket of Jewish women for whom Jewishness is essential. Um, it's not that they observed every Sabbath. It's not that they observed all the holidays, but something about being Jewish really determined many major facets of their lives. For example, what neighborhoods they could live in, who they were likely to marry, 
and even the amount of education they were likely to get. And I'm not talking about religious education, I'm talking about secular education. And then there's a third group of Jewish women for whom being Jewish was essentially not all that significant, but every once in a while they would discover, because somebody would remind them, that it was actually very significant. So in the preface, I open with two women, and you can see them here. I talk about a colonial wife, mother, grandmother, widow, named Grace Nathan, who was born in New York City in 1752 and who died in 1831, and you've probably never heard of her. I also talk about Emma Lazarus, who was born in 1849, also in New York City, who had a much shorter life. She died in 1887. She was known not for being a wife, not for being a mother, but rather for being the poet whose poem, um, The New Colossus, has welcomed the huddled masses yearning to breathe free to America for more than a century. But what you may not know is that Emma Lazarus was Grace Nathan's great granddaughter. So here's a story of two women in one family. And what's stunning about it is how many of the themes that I will ultimately talk about in the book, their lives encapsulated. They were women, they were Americans, and they were Jews. As women, their lives were constrained by the, the social class and the rules and regulations that society set down for women at their moment in time. Um, they could do certain things. There were many things that as women, they could not do. But as Americans, what was really surprising is that they used America's freedoms sometimes to act in ways that led them to determine the future of Jewish life in America. And it's really quite stunning to see that. So let me tell you a little bit about Grace Nathan first. Grace Nathan left us some letters, so we know something about her life. She also, by the way, left us some unpublished poetry. Who knows, maybe she influenced her great-granddaughter. And in one of those letters, she was writing to a relative, and she was really worried about a niece of hers who had been spitting up blood for several months. But the doctor said, don't be too worried. Her corsets were too tight. So clothing matters which is how I got into the book in the first place. Um, but Grace Nathan does something really stunning towards the end of her life. She imagines, she, she writes at the end of her life something called an ethical will. It's a document where you leave your life's lessons to the next generation. And in it, she told her only son that at her death, he should only keep his beard for seven days. If you know something about Jewish tradition, you may know that for many traditional Jewish men, following the death of a parent, they will not shave for a minimum of 30 days, if not for an entire year. Emma Lazarus was also, in her own way, a maverick. In a poem called In Exile, she imagined her ancestors trudging out of Spain and coming to this new land that had given her people the freedom to follow Moses's law. And then she says, and to think the thoughts Spinoza taught. Benedict de Spinoza was a 17th century Dutch Jewish philosopher whose ideas were deemed so heretical by the Jewish community that he was excommunicated. In claiming Spinoza in her poem, she too was a maverick. And one of the things that I was most interested in in this book was writing about Jewish women who were mavericks in so many different places um, in the Jewish community, but also in American life, those who left their marks on their families, like Grace Nathan, and those who left their marks on America and America's Jews, like her great granddaughter, Emma Lazarus. So shall we turn to conversation? That sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Nadell, for that introduction. I was um, struck reading the book by the way in which you used that series of family photographs that you shared with us uh, in your presentation as a way of um, opening up a window 
on American Jewish women's history. And I, I just love to hear more about that. Um, here at the, uh, at the Houston Jewish History Archive, obviously, we're very fortunate to have many collections of family photographs. And I often hear from, from people that I, that I work with, um, oh, you wouldn't possibly be interested in this picture of my parents, or you wouldn't possibly be interested in my grandmother's wedding picture. What, what kind of historical meaning you know, could it possibly have? Um, so could you talk a little bit more about uh, sources and, and methodology for writing women's history and why you chose to open the book with the anecdote about your family photographs? So thanks. First, first of all, I hope you say every time they say you, you couldn't possibly be interested, of course you say, of course I am. Of course I want those photos. Um, photos tell such powerful stories. Um, I, I, I'm currently teaching the history of the Holocaust and I am, I've been really struck by some particular photos um, coming out of out of the out of the Holocaust, um, including Wendy Lauer's um, new book, The Ravine, that just came out, which is about a single Holocaust photo. Right, it's an entire book unpacking that photo, um, discovering um, the murderers, the victims, and the photographer behind it. Um, and I think I, I think what I really drew me to talking about the photos was I, I can't remember when when it was that I said that's how to open this story. Um, but there, there's something that they're so accessible that almost everyone who's on, on here this, this afternoon has family photos. So when you talk about family photos, you, you immediately make some kind of, of connection. Um, and those are easier to understand, I think, than deciphering in an archive letters written in a script that's so difficult to read that I actually had to hire somebody who knew how to read that colonial era script. I just, it was just going to take me too long to parse it out. Um, but there is another really important part of your question, which is that for so long, the sources about women's history were they, they, they were buried. You know, what an archive collects says a great deal about its moment in time. Archives don't, many archives don't collect everything. I'll give you like two examples that jump out at me. Um, years ago, I was trying to work on a woman named Anita Liebsen, who wrote a very early book in Jewish women's history, right around the time of the birth of, of the new women's history in the early 1970s. And I managed to track down um, her, a family member who said that nobody wanted her archive, nobody wanted her records, so they were all destroyed. So it's it's gone, and that happens so often. But sometimes archives also bury things about women. So when I was working on an earlier book called Women Who Would Be Rabbis, I was reading through the papers of a rabbi. I was hoping to find evidence about things that his wife, who was actually president of the Women of Reformed Judaism, it was called something else in those days, and I was because I didn't have any papers of hers, and I came across a typescript that was clearly written in the first person female, and that meant that either he was pretending to be in drag when he was writing that, or it was hers, but it was miscategorized. And I eventually was able to prove, not that I doubted it from the beginning, but I was eventually able to prove that she had published it someplace else under her own name. So the whole process of doing women's history has really pushed us to think in new directions and to seek out new sources, which I did for this project as well. I want to follow up on that a little bit. And maybe also um, in your answer, it, it occurred to me that maybe this is also a bit of a question for Josh or that you two could discuss a little bit. But, um, you know, you write really about what you were just saying on page nine, I have this quote written down to peer into their world, we must use our imaginations. Um, and I'm wondering what kinds of, you know, maybe, again, like creative or unorthodox um, methodologies that might be might be required for writing women's history and also maybe in the spirit of your book and showing how these women changed America, how does that change what we think of as history and, and historical methodologies more generally? And, and for Josh, I wonder if, a, if your contribution to this might also be to talk a little bit about mm, the role of the archive as someone who's building an archive, like the role of an archive in, um, you know, the feminist role of an archive, let's say, right? 
in having that in mind as you collect materials? Yeah, um, those are all like amazing, amazing questions. This is such a great conversation to have because these are things that we all we all think about. Um, I would say so when I when I wrote about having to peer into their lives I, in that section, I, I talked about some material culture because the, these these women didn't leave sources. We did have we had what we had were actually inventories of objects that existed in their houses when they passed. And um, there's a, the, the historian who's really the master of this is Laura Liebman, whose new book, The Art of the Jewish Family, takes five objects and reconstructs the lives of five early American Jewish women, including one who was born enslaved and died as one of the wealthiest women in New York. Um, but I didn't have Laura Liebman's book when I was writing this because she wrote after me. And when I read it, I, I, I just thought, oh my goodness, if I could have had that. But, but it is that, that, that element of creativity um, that, that you're talking about um, has to be there. But, but I mean, for Josh, it, it's, I think it's really important. Like, what do you think of, like when you're collecting, do you have, like, what are your policies? Like, how do you, how do you go about collecting? There, there is an awesome power um, in being the gatekeeper that decides what's historically relevant, uh, what's historically useful, and and who gets included. Um, the the song from Hamilton is playing in my head right now. I'm not going to sing, um, <laughs> but it but but it is. Um, and one of the things that I that I always say when I when I meet with families and we look through you know dusty photo albums and letters and things that you know, are probably going to the dumpster for one reason or another uh, in some cases is that we, we often don't know. We often don't know what is going to be of significance to a researcher or a family member um, in 10 or 20 or, or 50 years. Um, all we can do is, is guess. And I, I consider myself fortunate to have been trained in an era when uh, we're all much more sensitive to, to women's history, to social history, to, to understanding that the fabric of daily life matters, that recording those stories and having to look for sources that are not just you know, government documents and, and published sources um, matters. But oftentimes those are also the hardest sources to find as well, which, which presents quite the dilemma. Uh, I, was, I was thinking back to Grace Nathan, some some of her letters got published in an early volume by the rabbi of her synagogue and he actually when he introduces them you know what he says he says she's only in here because her husband fought in the revolutionary war and her brother was the rabbi was the not the rabbi but the chazan the spiritual leader of the synagogue that's the only reason that she's in here so i sort of felt like you know there, there there's a bit of a project here of of a restoration. I mean, the you know, it's Women's History Month. Um, the woman who advocated for Women's History Month, who started the, the the program for it, was Gerda Lerner, who was a Jewish woman who was um, arrested by the Nazis after they annexed Austria um, when they were trying to pressure. She and her mother were arrested. They were trying to pressure um, her father to turn over his property. She came to America. She's in her 40s when she gets a PhD at Columbia University. And she essentially is the pioneer of women's history in the United States. And in the 70s, she starts petitioning for a Women's History Week. And we now have Women's History Month. And you never know how your point of view is going to change and what's going to become important, important questions. So yeah, collecting is really, really tough, but there's also, I mean, today with digital storage, maybe it's easier, but there is a finite, you know, when it's in physical space, it's finite. There's only so many Hollinger boxes that you can have. That's true. That's true. Um, before we take things in a bit of a different direction, I just want to remind um, the audience joining us today that you can submit questions for Dr. Nadell through the Q&A button uh, on your Zoom webinar screen. Looks like we've gotten a couple already. Uh, but keep them coming, and we are going to, to read them and try to answer a few of them at the end. So there um, are some um, women in your book who are very familiar to most of us, if not all of us, Henrietta Zold, Emma Lazarus, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, 
Um, but then there are dozens more uh, women whose, whose stories you um, reconstruct and, and tell that are not household names, but who have had a tremendous impact um, either on the American Jewish community or on American society more broadly in uh, culture, in politics, and in, in other fields. So this is an opportunity for you. I know it's a little bit like asking you to pick a, a favorite child, but who are some of the lesser known um, giants in American Jewish women's history that you really enjoyed um, including in this book? So of course I have some favorites. <laughs> I think we all. I think we all do. Um, it was in writing this book. I had an embarrassment of riches. Um, there's a, an enormous two-volume encyclopedia called Jewish Women in America. I could have included every single name that appears in that encyclopedia, um, and I had to make really hard choices. And I made choices to follow, and I call them characters, which is, sounds like I'm writing fiction, I'm not, but certain characters who, whose lives would had enough um, texture to them that I could both make the points about contributions to American life and contributions to Jewish life. So one of, one of the um, women that I follow in um, the second chapter, her name's Rosa Sonnenschein. Rosa Sonnenschein came to America in the 1860s she was a rabbi's wife. They settle in St. Louis. He's the rabbi of the Reformed Synagogue. And she does in America what a good rabbi's wife does. She um, gives birth there to the fourth of her four children. She's active in various organizations. Um, she does something amazing. In 1879, she founded what we think is the first Jewish women's book club in America. And if there are people watching who belong to book clubs and you think yours has been meeting for a long time, Hers has been meeting since 1879. And I've even seen a list. It's not, not actually, it didn't make it all into this book, but it made it to an article. I've seen a list of the themes that they read on. Um, and, and two years ago, when I was working on that, they were reading about immigration. So connecting to Melissa's program that's coming up later this week. Um, so she was, so she's very unusual. She founds a Jewish women's book club in 1879. She was unusual in another way because in 1892, she walked out on her husband. Now it's very rare to get divorced in the 19th century. And it's so rare that one needs grounds to get divorced. She abandoned him. He could divorce her. He wasn't going to have to pay her alimony. And so now she's got to earn a living. And she'd been doing some writing. So she moves to Chicago and founds what's called the American Jewess, the first English language Jewish women's magazine in the United States. And what's so important about it is it's a window. It's only published for about five years, but it's a window into a particular world. And, she, and what we see is we see her actually advocating for women's suffrage. We see her advocating for more women's rights in the synagogue. And stunningly, we see her as one of the first American Zionists. And we, we, you know, we think of Zionism, everybody talks about Henrietta Zold, founder of Hadassah. But this is eight, she's, she's in 1897, she goes to the first Zionist Congress that Theodore Herzl held in Basel, Switzerland. There are about five Americans who show up. She gets there. She notices that there's no representative of the American press. So she declares herself the sole representative of the press of the United States covering the, the Zionist Congress. And so she she's a very important figure. But also, here, here's a story about archives again. There was no full run in any single collection in the United States of the American Jewess. In the, um, at, the, at the end of the first decade of the 21st century, a very important organization, the Jewish Women's Archive, spearheaded digitizing the American Jewess. So it could pull a, a full collection together, but from different libraries, because one library was missing one, you know, would be missing a couple of issues. So it, it, it's the kind of research that I could do that couldn't have been done before, because how many different libraries could I have gone to trying to read a full collection? That's great. Love the JWA. They're a fantastic organization. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
maybe to follow up on that a little bit and this question of some of your favorites, I also um, <clears throat> was struck by the large role that class plays in determining which women we know about. So, you know, Rosa Sonnenschein, who may not be well known to us, it's clear from your description of her that she was educated, she had some status, right, as a rabbi's wife and this and that. Um, you know, and, and actually some of the women you discussed in the book, there was so much detail available about their biographies, um, but much less specificity available about sort of um, modest working women, you know, who you often have to discuss more generally. And so I'm curious about how the availability of materials, um, like something like what you're talking about with the American Jewish, um, based on categories like class or race also really affect our ability to reconstruct these histories, um, certainly of American Jewish women, but maybe also other, you know, intersectional uh, identities. Right. It, it, I mean, it's a very important question because we, you, you're, you're right. So the, I wrote chapter two and, and chapter three, I called them parallel lives because in chapter two, I write about women like Rosa Sonnenschein who have been in America, become well-to-do and, um, and are seen as this, we often call them the Central European Jewish migration. And then in, in the third chapter, in the same, roughly same time period, 1880s to 1920, I write about the East European Jewish immigrant women who, who are much poorer, They're the, the new immigrants who have come over. And what's, what's really difficult to get at is that poorer women and poor men did not tend to leave the kind of written record that would give us the level of detail because no archive was collecting the records and because they didn't think that they were they were necessary. Um, and so it, it I, I was lucky when I was writing um, the chapter about the women like Rosa Sonnenschein, uh, we a new source that Jonathan Sarna had published came out. I got a little bit of a better window, not uh, into the poor women um, of that era of that migration. But you're right, later on when I'm writing about the shirt waist makers who are on strike, it's much harder to get that detail. And in fact, there's a great new book out by Scott Seligman um, called The Great Kosher Meat War. I think that's the title of it. And um, he wanted, it, so it's about a, a kosher meat boycott in New York City in 1902. Um, and the women stage a strike um, because the price of meat is increased from 12 cents a pound, kosher meat, from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound. And I know, because he and I talked about this, he really wanted to find the women who were the strike leaders. And he had their names, but he could find only snippets of details about their lives. He even tried to, he even tracked down relatives and children, but just didn't have the kinds of sources that somebody like a Rosa Sonnenschein who's publishing, and I know she's, you know, the unsigned articles are her, is giving me a wealth of information. So it, it, that actually determined that the woman that I chose to follow of the, of the strikers was a woman named Bessie Abramowitz Hillman, because there was a lot of material about Bessie Abramowitz Hillman and much less about some of the other women. Just to follow up on that a little bit, because I'm curious, how do you think going forward, like th that we handle that so that we can include some of this stuff, even without that kind of detail that, that you're talking about? I, I think going forward in terms of where we are now, I think we'll be fine because now we have essentially an, embar an embarrassment of rich resources um, that are paying all sorts of, uh, you know, all, paying lots of attention to all different kinds of intersectionalities. But earlier, we don't. And when I was writing, for example, when I was writing about lesbian women, really did not have lots of sources for the earlier period. By the time I get to the feminist movement in the 1970s, I'm on solid ground because they create journals, they're very public. But earlier, they were very private because it was, they were, they were feared re retribution if they were out. So um, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, this is always a problem when trying to delve into the past and discover a group that was very circumspect about who they were because they, they feared that uh, the reactions that would be. Yeah, I think, you know, jumping off of that topic for a moment, there's been so much attention paid uh, internally within the American Jewish community just in the last year plus to the experiences of, of Jews of color. And I know that um, Jewish women of color are uh, 
um, you know, there are blog posts and articles and there's, there's, there's been a wealth of sources, but it's all very recent in terms of the things that seem to be widely available. Are there, are there, are there trails uh, or, or sources about the experiences of, of Jewish women of color that you were able to find in your research that are less well known and also I, less? Yeah, so I didn't because when I was writing, remember my book came out in 2019 and it went to the press in 2018. And the conversation about Jews of color had not heated up the way it has heated up in, in the years since then. Um, Laura Liebman has found some material about this and so has Aviva Ben-Ur because they, they focus on the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, there's, there's much more evidence about what today we would call Jews of color, but back, back then we probably would have called racially mixed marriages. And um, so there's, there's definitely much more information, but I was not able, like I, you know, I have a snippet about it in the last chapter. And uh, because then I'm already, then I'm in the 21st century. And so I have some material about it, but you're right. It's a very, very important subject. And it's great that that's one that the community is studying now. Yeah, and, and maybe just to sort of broaden this, you know, what we're talking about a little bit. Another thing I was curious about was how the category American Jewish women um, complicates our understandings of all of these atomized identity, um, which are sometimes conceived of as exclusive to each other, uh, uh, exclusive of each other, right? That um, Jewish and American at certain times have been uh, represented as, you know, incompatible identities. Uh, women and Jewish, right? Women are have, have historically, as you've noted, been on the margins. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about how writing a history like this and then also searching for these kind of hidden or elided, um, you know, characters and identities uh, can uh, kind of challenge the way that we think about, um, you know, what those identities are, right? What Jewish means, what American Jewish woman means. Right. And that that's actually why in my opening remarks, I talked about those three buckets, those three categories. Um, because I, one of the things that I, I say um, in, in the um, preface to the book is that I, I would periodically tell my friends that I'm writing this book and they would, they would turn to me and they would say, you can't write a book about Amer the history of America's Jewish women, all America's Jewish women, look how different all of us are. You know, and I'm, I'm sitting there and thinking, actually, no, we're not really all that different. We all have kids about the same age. They all go to the same school. <laughs> but um, it was... It's it's a challenge, and I don't I don't really grapple extensively with defining what it means to be an American. Um, I use simply geography for that. I didn't. It's not North American, and I did not go into the Caribbean. I just simply used the the um, fifty United States, and I I don't grapple so much with Jew with what it means to be Jewish, except to say that it runs on an enormous spectrum. So we have everything from the woman who is Sabbath observant to the communist who sends her daughter to, to, sends her daughter to school on the Jewish high holidays, but keeps her daughter home on May Day because that's the, the International Workers Day. So I tried to get that breadth um, and, and women is also a com very complicated ca category. And I tried again to get the breadth. The one thing that I didn't do in the book, I did not really talk about Jewish women and their cultural contributions. I, I wanted to, I had, I had a 35 page single spaced outline that I was working from when I was writing this. And when I got to the culture part, I was just simply overwhelmed. And I will say that when I got reviewed in the New York Times, the only sentence of criticism was is that Barbara Streisand only has one sentence in the book. So I thought, well, you know, I have a big choice. I either write an entire book about Barbara Streisand because she's has a very outsized personality or she gets the one sentence where it works in, in the book. Um, I should also tell you one other thing. The original manuscript was twice as long. And I had a very, I got a lot of advice. I, I wanted this book to reach my colleagues, but I wanted it to reach widely. Um, I, I really feel that American, that, that women's history didn't have 
a kind of work in Jewish women, American Jewish women that um, could be pointed to in women's history classes around the country. And I was told I need to cut. And I cut, I cut really like crazy. So there's a lot that's not in there, but I know exactly where it is because it's in the original version. Maybe there's another manuscript in there somewhere. <laughs> Keep it for the archives. <laughs> Something for the archives, right? There you go. Um, when we when we think about um, you know how we're how we're trained as historians, we're, the conventions of historical writing often you know compel us to write stories of linear progression with a beginning, middle, and an end, and we follow you know chronology is a standard standard convention in, in historical writing. So when you look at the long trajectory of American Jewish women's history, as you've done in your book, do you see, is it, is it a story of triumph? Is it a story of um, uh, tragedy or, or overcoming tragedy? Um, do you see a linear progression toward greater rights and inclusion, toward greater equality? Or, or is the story more, more uneven? What, what conclusions can you, can you draw about the arc? Well, I, I wouldn't, I would never, I wouldn't want to be teleological. I wouldn't want to say, you know, we start here and then we have this, you know, great end point. American women have gained significant rights. I mean, we, we've just had a century past the century mark where American women um, gained the right to vote. And rights for American women have advanced. Um, it's slow, it's not where it, it should be, and Jewish women play a, a role in this. What I think the where you really, really see this is in um, the section that I wrote about second wave feminism. So second wave feminism, Jewish women are so disproportionately represented that it's astonishing. Um, they were 12% of the founding members of the National Organization of Women. American Jews made up about 3%. They, they just really stand out in the leadership. I'm not saying they were necessarily disproportionately represented in the rank of file, although I think they might have been, but they had ascended to such prominence in the position of leadership. And you mentioned, even in your opening remarks, Bella Absug, um, obviously Betty Friedan and the Feminine Mystique. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's really, really striking to me. And I think that um, this is a place where we do see tremendous change. We saw very, really rapid change from the 1960s to the end of the 20th century. And the question is how much that change will continue now. Um, especially with in wake of the pandemic, we know that American women are the ones who have really suffered, really lost tremendous, um, uh, you know, the, the, so much of what they had advanced to. Many of them have lost their jobs. They've been they're burnt out. You know, they're they're trying to juggle children and uh, a career and the home all at the same time. So I wouldn't say that it's it, it's a road of progression for American women or Jewish women. Um, but there are moments, arc moments, where there are great transformations. Yeah, I, I noticed um, when, when I was talking to Josh about this, I noticed that there were a number of moments in the book throughout the historical progression when um, you mentioned sort of attitudes toward intermarriage, right, in the Jewish community. And at every instance, there was some way of blaming that on women. Right. It, it was always a little different, like from col the colonial period onward to the 19th century to now, right? The argument was always that somehow the fault of Joshua and I thought, right, there, you, so you see both, maybe there are some ways in which there's this progressive arc and then some ways in which there's a cyclical arc and we yes. sort of right. keep holding back in, um, you know, and those somehow coexist. But um, I think we're going to move on now to some questions from our audience because we've had quite a few um and uh the first one <clears throat> which is about something we didn't really touch on too much is from a, a student of ours ari forsyth who's a future professional historian herself i think um and uh she asks about uh the religious education of some of these jewish american women and where did they receive religious education either formally or informally what kinds of influences do you see in the way that they understood and defined their um, Judaism? Mm 
Right. That are, first of all, Ari, great to meet you. That's such a good, a good question, such an important question. Um, this is actually back to Melissa's point about cycles. So we we have different cycles of Jewish education, including Jewish day schools in the early American period. And then we have in when we get to the 20th century and we get to you know, the great the great expansion in terms of the size of the Jewish community, um, there are quite a few women who played major roles in shaping various Jewish educational systems. Everybody knows about a group of men who are called the Benderly Boys, but they're actually a whole group of, of American Jewish women in the Reform Movement and the Conservative Movement, but also in the Orthodox Movement, who were pioneers in advancing Jewish educational opportunities for, um, for uh, girls and boys. And so that's been a, an area of great interest and, and tremendous change. I, I recommend to you a book called The Women Who Reconstructed Judaism, which is about, about some of these um, pioneering figures. Um, great. Another question here is about um, family dynamics or the roles of uh, wives and husbands and mothers and fathers and how those have changed um, throughout American Jewish history, I guess, expectations or social constructions of the family. Right. Um, what, what I love about that question is that it points to the fact that it's not possible to write women's history without writing about men. Uh, what women's history has done is it's opened up new kinds of questions like that, like about family dynamic. Um, and we and there's certain one of the things I paid a lot of attention to, maybe because it came up with Rosa Sonnenschein, is I was interested in divorce. Um, when when do we begin to see divorce? Uh, she, uh, Melissa talked about that I wrote also about intermarriage, but I'm also interested in in the fact that that as divorce becomes more prevalent in American society, as the laws requiring um, grounds for divorce are thrown out. Um, how does that affect the Jewish community? And so that's a, a major factor affecting what's going on inside the family as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking now about maybe because I just taught it in one of my classes, but the the, the divorce scene in Hester Street, I know uh -huh. Josh is in his classes too. Um, I love and, that scene. That's right, not amazing. just not just the, you know, that she also was getting divorced, right? That's a late 19th century, set in the late 19th century, but of course it's being made in the 1970s. So it's really influenced by second wave feminism, right? And those changing uh, norms around divorce. So, you know, she's sort of depicting the, the ethos of one era through the image of another in a way, right. but yeah. Um, Absolutely. So we have another question from um, a former student of mine and uh, someone who's uh, worked very much at the Houston Jewish History Archive over the uh, past couple of years, Katie Weber. And Katie writes, how can archives connect to the histories of women who may be less connected to institutions um, and therefore less visible to the historian? Where are the places we should look and conversations we should have so that archives don't reify the exclusion that certain women experience from synagogues and other traditional institutions? Oh, that's such a great question, Katie. Because, because you're right, it's much easier to write the history of organizations. They've left their records and people have left their names in those, in, in those files. Um, here's where that private collecting is so critical. Um, I, and you know, what has, I mean, every once in a while you, you read about this, you know, somebody opens a suitcase that's been sitting in their attic and it's these letters from family members that nobody ever thought to donate to an archive. So that, that is one of the ways, of course, now it's all on email and I don't know how we're collecting email. You could probably tell me. Um, and it, it's, we need to go after those sources, but of course we don't tend to go after them unless the people have some kind of reputation that makes us go after them. You know, they've done something that makes them noteworthy at some point in time. Um, there are a few questions here actually about the history of Sephardic Jewish women mm -hmm. and about 
um, the backgrounds of some of the women that you've discussed, specifically someone asked about Grace Nathan, whether she was a German Jew. I know from reading the book that she had Sephardic heritage as well. That's not evident in her married name, but is no. her maiden name. But um, so I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where Sephardic women fit into this American Jewish history. So Grace Nathan is such a perfect example because we have this image of in American Jewish history that the Sephardic Jews who came in the colonial period and the Ashkenazic Jews never mixed. And of course, her parents were a mixed marriage. Her father was Ashkenazic and her mother was Sephardic. And it was a great scandal when they got married um, because apparently he didn't invite a lot of the Sephardic community to the wedding. Um, and her brother, of course, was the leader of the one congregation which would have had a Sephardic ritual in, in colonial days. Um, so the Sephardic Jews, so they, they appear the way Grace Nathan, Nathan appears, but by and large, numbers are, you know, the size of the population dictates the decisions about what I was able to write about. So I don't write extensively about Sephardic Jews, although many more came in the era of the Great Migration, um, but they, they and settled, for example, in Seattle. Um, and I, so I'm aware of it, but they don't, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time parsing out Sephardic identity versus Ashkenazic identity. I was focused more on Jewish identity. There's a question that uh, was submitted prior to the um, program by Lisa, and it, it's about sort of translating historical knowledge into action. And she wrote, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Lisa, but she wrote, knowing history, how do you recommend that we better equalize women's representation in Jewish communal leadership roles? Right, such an important question because this, is, this has been on the agenda since the, the feminist movement burst forth in the 1970s in the Jewish community. Um, the, the question of equalizing women in leadership roles in the Jewish community. Um, I, and Josh, you, I'm, and Melissa, I'm sure you, you, you share this sentiment of mine. There's a reason to know history because it helps us understand our present. It's, we don't, it, it's not repeated, but it informs our present. And I think knowing about some of the women who were fighting for the feminist movement, including I'm thinking of someone like Jacqueline Levine um, from the American Jewish Congress in the 1970s, who takes a message of Jewish feminism to the Jewish communal organizations, not to the synagogue, but to, she was at the American Jewish Congress. And I think knowing, even just having the long view of how long Jewish women have been pushing for this kind of equality within the Jewish community um, will help to sens sensitize. But then we ha also have to think about the operations of those organizations and how, what is the best way to affect change? Do you affect it from within or do you affect it from without? There are over, I, I was once told there are over 9,000 Jewish communal organizations today. And then somebody told me that was an old figure and that there are actually 12,000 Jewish communal organizations. Some of that is because people have just said, I'm not gonna go to the kind of the big ones and I'm gonna um, create my own where some of that change can happen. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in SWIGS, the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, one of the our sort of missions is about engaged research. So it's a really, I think, important thing sometimes for especially academics who I think sometimes we can get kind of caught up in, you know, writing and thinking about things. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, the feminist movement is also all about uh, taking theory and, you know, turning it into praxis. And so um, I think it's maybe interesting for us to think a little bit about like how we can use this work. I mean, you, one, you said it yourself that you wrote this on purpose to have a kind of activist intent, right? That it could be used as a teaching tool and also to reach a broad audience uh, about a topic that's not really written about very much in that mainstream, um, you know, for that mainstream audience. So, uh, you know, I think well, it's, I would say the, the whole project of writing women's history grew out of the feminist movement. It was the way this group of women were going to contribute 
to finding a usable past. And they talked about it. I mean, they're very, they're, when you read the voices of that first generation of women's historians, Gerda Lerner actually has a quote that obviously has impressed me so much that I used it about in three different books, but I didn't use it in this one. <laughs> one day I realized how often I had used it. She said, you know, my, my impulse to history came out of my life, not out of my head. And I mean, I probably paraphrased it slightly, but it, but it's, yeah, it's, it's what was missing. And, and so I think most of us who write women's history today and do women's studies work, I think that it is part of an ongoing political project. This is a, a question that comes to us from Shifra, uh, and it might, depending on how you, you choose to answer it, move us in a question uh, or a discussion about the intersection between anti-Semitism and misogyny. And that is, if you could change one major misconception that people have about American Jewish women, what would it be? Uh, well, probably it would be, you know, some of the old stereotypes about the nagging Jewish mother, the, um, uh, you know, self-centered uh, Jewish American princess, both of which are there somewhat, but, I, but I'm glad you raised the topic of anti-Semitism. Um, I'm not, I don't want to talk about those representations, which are anti-Semitic. Often they were, um, uh, although they're also misogynist because they're perpetuated by, often by American Jewish men. But actually my new research, because I finished this a long time ago, my new research is on um, uh, America, gender, and anti-Semitism, because no one has really paid attention to the subject of anti-Semitism and any kind of gendered inflection. And it, it's really kind of stunning to me because we've been seeing um, scholarship in Holocaust studies uh, using gender as a lens for you know 25 years or more now, but nobody in terms of American Jewish history has used it. And so I've, I've written a couple, a couple of pieces already um, that are in, impressed, they're, they're not out yet. Um, I, I'm struck by a couple of things. First of all, and it, this goes back to Melissa's earlier question about cycles or an arc. It, it turns out that if I go back and reread the book, anti-Semitism comes up in every single chapter. I'm not sure that I was so conscious of it as I was doing it, but it's there. It's all across American Jewish history. So that's a cycle. That's not an arc. Um, the second thing that I've, I've discovered so far in my research is that American Jewish women tend to experience anti-Semitism through their family, um, especially because until the feminist movement, they're ensconced much more closely within the family or they're working in family businesses. So they, they experience it through their children, through their spouses, and that seems to me to stand out. I don't, I, I don't have comparative data yet, but that that's where I'm starting. I'll give you just one stunning example. I found a letter in the Washington Post uh, about the anti-Semitism that this mother's son was experiencing in his trial. It was the trial of Leo Frank. The letter was from Leo Frank's mother. So I am, I, I, and, and I've got lots more evidence about women as mothers experiencing anti-Semitism. So I'm just at the beginning of the project. But that's that's where I where I am. So I'm glad we got to talk about that a little. So let's let's return to a, a topic that you raise early in the book, which is this question of how can you possibly write a comprehensive history of American Jewish women? Right? Um, there's there's so much diversity. Of, of every imaginable kind. Um, and you push back against that, uh, obviously, which begs the question, what, what do America's Jewish women have in common then across the generations and, and the eras? What, what is it that binds them together? What I found as one of the overarching themes was, first of all, a, a powerful sense that being Jewish set them apart. America's Jewish women were a part of America's women, but they also were set apart from them. And then the second large theme was that, and this may be of how of my selection, but that they were activists in so many different 
places. And those are, that's who I was drawn to. But I am really struck, even as I read, um, you know, news articles about, especially now with COVID, about, uh, about some of the people who've died from COVID and what, what they recount about their lives, they all talk about, about the organizations they belong to, the causes they were interested in. But America's Jewish women seem to me to be deeply political. I, I don't mean in a narrow sense of, um, you know, national party politics or local politics. I mean that almost every action is a political action, whether you're a member of the PTA, whether you're standing up for anti against anti-Semitism when somebody calls you out, whether you join Hadassah, joining Hadassah, joining the Jewish women's organizations, and I wrote a lot about them, those organizations were political organizations and are political organizations, but they were often dismissed pejoratively as just social or activities, but they were never just that. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If you're if you're sitting at home in the audience and you have a burning question in your pocket, this is your last uh, warning to submit it into the um, Q and A window. Dr. Nadell, I'm curious what what surprised you about the the writing of this book? Was there anything that you I mean, in your long career, you've you've written so much about, about American Jewish women. You edited an anthology, you wrote a book about women who would be rabbis. What, were there any particularly new discoveries that came to light for you in, in putting this book together that were uh, memorable? So obviously there, there, was, there was so much that I was surprised by because there were, there were topics that I ended up talking about like women in the military that I would not that I had not talked about before, but there's always those great discoveries that you know ju that just jump out at you because like it, it's almost like it's serendipity. Oh my gosh, th this this works. Um, so I, I'll, I'll tell you one. Um, I wanted to write about Jewish women who were active in the Soviet Jewry movement, and some of the people who are on here today may remember that. Um, during the heyday of the Soviet Jewry movement, and, and maybe this happened to you, Josh or, or Melissa, um, when you were bar bat mitzvahed, you were actually twinned with a child in the Soviet Union who um, couldn't have a bar bat mitzvah. So I saw a letter in the archives from a teenager written in 1982 from North Miami Beach, and she wrote to her Soviet bat mitzvah twin, and she said, had you um, ever gotten the letters and the stationery that I sent you? Because this particular American um, young woman liked to collect stationery. And so I wanted to find the twin. So I did what any good historian does today. I went on Facebook and I found the twin in Jerusalem and she's become a web designer. And I said, are you in touch with this twin? And so her first answer was, well, you should know that there were not that many kids in the Soviet Union who weren't having bar and bat mitzvahs. We had lots of twins. And so I said, okay, well, what about this particular one? And she said, no, that she and Cheryl Sandberg, who is the COO of Facebook, um, they are not Facebook friends, but that her father and Sandberg's mother are. And I love that story. It's just, that's one of those places where technology and the archive, they just met up. Yeah, that's really a, a phenomenal discovery and, and serendipitous for sure. And, and when I was reading that in the, uh, in the book towards the end, it was, it's, wow. There were, there, there were so many moments throughout the, the, the reading of the book where I found myself rushing to the back uh, of the book to get the footnotes to see where you had uncovered this this story or that quote, it, it was it was a true delight to read. And um, as we're as we're running out of time, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Nadell, for for joining us today um, to talk about uh, this incredible book, which I'm sure is going to be used not only by by scholars and and students of American Jewish history and women's history, but but also by American Jewish women, I'm sure, for years to come. I want to thank my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Weininger, for uh, helping me to ask the questions today, and all of you for uh, joining us and submitting your questions.
Uh, we had a lot of support behind the scenes from Star Dickerson, our program administrator here uh, in Rice Jewish Studies, and uh, also John Waterhouse in uh, the office of the um, Dean of the School of Humanities. And um, it's been a pleasure. Um, please uh, look us up uh, at jewishstudies.rice.edu for more information about the Houston Jewish History Archive and about um, our faculty and other program offerings here at Rice. And uh, we hope to see you again at a future program. Thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, stay well. Thank you.